So climate can impact uh, the composition of your communities and this can impact species interactions, but climate change doesn't just alter uh, the composition of communities in a given location. It can alter all, it can also alter how those species behave and that alone can have large impacts on species and their interactions with other species. Now one large class of behavior or traits that climate change can impact is phenology. And for the rest of the lecture, we're gonna focus on the consequences of alteration to phenology. Now phenology is just the timing of biological activity over the course of a year, particularly as it relates to climate. So, some examples of biological events that um, occur during the year um, and that are timed at different periods of time include things like leaf drop or leaf flush, hibernation coming out of diapause, uh, germination, the timing of these things, migration. So all of these events may occur on a normal regular basis, um, but there's usually some timing to them. So they always occur at the same time of the year. And it turns out that many organisms use climatic cues like temperature or sometimes proxies for those climatic conditions like day length uh, to time these events to make sure that they are doing them at the right time when the environment is most suitable. Now temperature is a very common cue for a lot of phenological uh, events. And uh, this is obviously gonna be impacted then by climate change. As the climate changes, temperature changes, and so organisms are gonna be doing these things at different times of the year. Now, in contrast to temperature, day length is often also a common indicator uh, for when a species should start something, like flush out your new leaves or go into hibernation. Uh, what, but it's worth thinking about why day length actually is such a common indicator for more, many species when in many cases it's, it is actually temperature that has a large impact on these biological events. Well, it turns out that day length is often a more reliable indicator of the temperature at a given time of year. Um, at, than the actual temperature at any one time. Um, it's more likely to be representative of the sort of average or likely conditions. Um, and this is because temperature from day to day can be highly variable and you can get unseasonably warm or unseasonably cold temperatures. And so you wouldn't necessarily want to use those as a cue to do some things. For example, a lot of plants are very attuned to the length of day for when to flower or when to leaf out. Um, and they might not respond as strongly to temperature. And this is often very beneficial because if you have an unseasonably warm period early in the winter, that could cause species that respond to temperature uh, to leaf out or flower um, early when the risk of them freezing, uh, because it's still in the middle of the winter, uh, is quite high. And so day length is often uh, a common indicator uh, for species that is often more reliable. Now, interactions between species often rely on a very delicate balance of phenological overlap, particularly for events that may occur over a very short period of time, such as flowering. Uh, and climate change has the potential to disrupt this delicate balance. And we refer to this disruption uh, as phenological mismatch. So this is when interacting species change the timing of events in their life cycles at different rates that impact their interaction. Now, there are a couple of ways in which this can arise. It could occur because species might not be responding to the same cues in order to time their phenological uh, events. Um, and so maybe one responds to temperature and one does not. 
However, we can also have phenological mismatch if species do respond to the same cue, but maybe they don't respond at the same rate. So an increase in temperature may cause a bigger change in the timing of an event for one species and less of a change for the other. To see an example of this, we'll look at changes in phenology that have occurred in an alpine meadow in Colorado. Um, and this research was done at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab up at almost 3,000 meters elevation. Now, in this alpine environment, there is a very short growing season, very long winter period where the area is completely covered in snow uh, for around 202 days out of 365. So most of the year, this environment is snow covered. Now, animals can cope with this by either hibernating, um, going inactive, or they can leave. They can migrate and go to lower elevations. But either way, animals use environmental cues to time the end of hibernation uh, or to decide when to go back, when to arrive um, in this alpine environment. But these cues can be affected by climate change. Here are just two examples um, looking at changes in phenology for two different species, the marmot and the robin. Uh, looking at the first sighting of these guys um, at the beginning of spring, so when they show up again, the marmot um, doesn't migrate, it hibernates. The robin, on the other hand, migrates further down uh, elevation and then returns in the spring. And in both cases, what you see is that the first sighting of these species um, has gotten progressively earlier. The date of first sighting is, is a lower number, so it's earlier in the year. So climate change is leading to a shift in their phenology. They're returning back uh, to the alpine or they're coming out of hibernation earlier. So if we look at marmots, why are they ending hibernation earlier? Uh, and we can look at the relationship between the date of the first sighting and the mean minimum at April temperature. So that's sort of the end of winter, beginning of spring. What's the lowest temperature at that point? And you can see as that minimum temperature has increased, uh, that the marmots come out earlier. So it appears that there's a direct response uh, of the end of hibernation to these increasing temperature. But the question is, how are the plants responding? Uh, because of course the marmots when they come out of hibernation are gonna be hungry and then they're gonna need to eat something. A common phenological event in a plant's life is flowering time. And presumably uh, when you would think that if it's getting warmer, plants should be flowering sooner. It's a sign that they're coming out and becoming active uh, earlier in the year. However, it turns out that April minimum temperature wasn't a strong predictor of plant phenology. Instead, they found that the date of bare ground, first bare ground, uh, was a strong pr uh, predictor. So this indicates that Plant phenology is strongly controlled uh, by the timing of snow melt, so when the first bare ground appears. And this is important for things like marmots because when plants actually start coming out and being active, that determines resource availability. And the fact that plants are responding to a different cue than animals like the marmots should be a clue that there's a potential for a problem here. And in fact, what has been happening is that while temperature was increasing over this period of time during the study, the amount of snowfall hadn't really changed. And in fact, snow melt, the date of snow melt, had not gotten earlier, even though it was getting warmer. What does this mean for marmots? Well, if we look at the amount of snow left on the date that marmots are coming out of hibernation, over time from 1975 to 2000, there has been an increase in the amount of snow uh, that is left. 
when they're emerging from hibernation. And so that means they're coming out of hibernation earlier, and that leaves a longer period of time before the food starts getting produced. So animals and their food are not responding to the same environmental cues, and this is leading to trophic mismatch. Now, this um, trend is unlikely to continue indefinitely because, of course, as the temperatures get warmer, the snow is going to melt earlier as well. And in fact, since 2000, there has been an increase in the date in first uh, in the bare ground. So this trophic mismatch is probably just a temporary problem. Um, but for other species, it's more of an issue. The example of the marmot is a good example of trophic mismatch which is a type of phenological mismatch uh, in which a resource or prey phenology responds differently to a climatic change than does the phenology of its consumer or its predator. Now, in the case of the marmot, this trophic mismatch appears to be only temporary as snowmelt uh, arrives earlier and earlier. The, the phenologies of the the marmot and the plants it eats are probably going to become more closely aligned. However, for other animals, the problem of trophic mismatch may not improve over time. And one group of organisms for which trophic mismatch might be a real problem are some migratory uh, organisms that use day length as a cue. Uh, because if they, their cue to migrate isn't changing, um, but other things are changing, well, it's very possible that they might stop arriving at the right time and miss a very critical feeding period. An example of this can be seen with caribou in Greenland. Um, over time, as it's getting warmer, there's evidence that plants are emerging earlier in their summer feeding grounds. Uh, caribou are, are famous for their large uh, migration pathways and having uh, extensive feeding grounds in the winter that vary over, are quite different from their feeding grounds in the summer. And usually uh, the caribou will give birth once they arrive in the summer feeding grounds. Now, in those summer feeding grounds, plants appear to be emerging earlier. However, if we look at the rate or the timing of the caribou birthing process, so this is shown here in black, this is the date of the first 5% of caribou births. So it's an estimate of when the birthing season begins. You can see that that was pretty stable across this period of time, but at the same period, plants are beginning to emerge earlier. So there's starting to be a mismatch between when the plants are emerging and when the caribou are arriving and giving birth. And the reason that this is a problem is that a lot of the plants are most nutritious when they're first emerging. Uh, we talked about the problems of being heavily defended. Well, often a lot of this new leaf is not so tough as it's coming out, so it's easier to digest. It's often not as well defended yet. And so it's a very critical period where the caribou can get a lot of nutrition out of this vegetation, which is important because they have their new babies that they need to support. Um, but if they're arriving later relative to the emergence of these plants, they might be missing that critical period where the plants are very nutritious. Another example in which trophic mismatch has led to a significant decline in fitness of an organism is seen in the migratory pied flycatcher shown here. Uh, this bird migrates also very long distances like the caribou to reach their European breeding grounds in the summer. And as temperatures have increased, trees are leafing out earlier and then the caterpillars that eat those leaves have also responded to temperature and are reaching peak populations earlier as well. And this period of peak caterpillar population is a critical feeding time 
for these pied flycatchers. So it's very important that these birds arrive in time to take advantage of the caterpillar emergence because these are the main source of food that these birds use while they're breeding and to feed their young. But of course, as the climate has changed, so has it changed in their breeding ground. And you can see here in figure A that the spring temperature in their breeding grounds in the Netherlands has been increasing over time. But uh, even though the temperatures are increasing, and along with that, the, uh, there's been a move of those caterpillars to break out earlier, uh, the birds are not arriving any earlier to their breeding grounds, which is shown here in figure B. Uh, this is the median arrival date, which is measured as days since March 31st. There's been no change uh, over this period, even though temperature has increased. However, even though they are not arriving any earlier, they are appearing to start laying their, ne their nests a little bit earlier in response to these temperatures and to the change in the peak caterpillar population, the timing of that. So the pied flycatcher, uh, on average, their laying date has uh, gotten earlier over this period, despite the fact that they're not arriving earlier. However, this sort of constrains their ability to respond to temperature because even though they're laying eggs earlier, there's a limit to how early they can lay them because they, of course, have to arrive first. And the time between the time they arrive and the time they start laying eggs is getting shorter and shorter. And of course, at some point, they won't be able to respond anymore if they don't arrive earlier. So the other issue, though, was even though birds are responding by laying their nests earlier, the question was, is this impacting bird fitness? And this is one of the first studies that went further than just looking to see what the change in the behavior was and instead tried to relate that directly to having an impact on the population. In this case, they did it by estimating the fitness of the population over time, which they did by looking at how many offspring were returning to the breeding ground the following year. And so the results of this inquiry are shown in figure D here. And what you can see is that their estimate of average fitness is declining during this period even though the birds have somewhat adjusted by laying their eggs earlier. So this clearly, this adjustment is not enough uh, because they're still missing the period of peak caterpillar abundance and it's having an effect on their population. So why can't the, the birds just adjust further? Why can't they adjust their arrival date? Well, this comes back down to the issue of what different organisms use as a cue uh, to time their major life events. And in this case, birds are using day length as the cue for migration. But of course, day length um, is not changing, while the optimal temperature for arrival is changing. So day length is meant to be a cue as to what the optimal temperature is. But now that temperature is changing, day length isn't. So they're no longer the day length is no longer such a good cue of the optimal temperature. Um, and this leads to trophic mismatch because of course, while the flycatchers are using day length as a cue, the prey are using temperature. So only one is changing. And so only one is responding, at least for the flycatchers in terms of their migration. Now, another form of interaction that relies on phenological synchrony is pollination. And this is particularly important if a plant is specialized with regards to its pollinators, like this plant, the early, uh, the early spider orchid, which is only pollinated by two different species. Now, pollination in this orchid and in some other orchids as well is actually not a mutualism because the flower doesn't provide any reward to the bee. Uh, instead, the flower and the plant tricks the bee into pollinating it. 
Now, the way that this system works is that male bees uh, tend to emerge earlier than the females. And during this time, the flower is there looking like uh, a female bee, and those male bees are all flying around looking for females, and they see this flower that looks like a bee, and so they pseudo-copulate with the flower. They try to breed with the flower, and in the process, they get pollen all stuck over themselves. Then frustrated, they fly off um, looking for another female. They find another flower. They try to breed with that, and they rub the pollen all over the plant. Uh, so the plants get uh, pollination services without paying anything for them. Now, orchids can't compete with real females because uh, they don't quite smell the same way. So if there are re real females flying around, the males don't get confused. They'll just go for the, the real thing. Um, but the, because they don't, the females and males don't emerge at the same time, the flower can take advantage of that short period of time uh, before the females come out to get the males to pollinate them. But it turns out that as we experience global warming, all three of these events, flowering time, emergence of males and females, are all being affected by the warmer temperatures. So some researchers went back into some herbarium records and some museum records and looked at the collection dates for these uh, plants, the orchids, and the collection of these bees, the female and the males, uh, because they're all only briefly active. So the flower doesn't last very long, the bees are only out for a very sh short period of time, so the collection dates of all of these things uh, give a very good estimate of their emergence or flowering time and they combined these uh, records with the temperature records that they have um, back for a long period of time to figure out the relationship between temperature and flowering or bee emergence. And here we can see that over a long period of time, if you put all the data together, the time to flowering uh, decreases as the spring temperature gets warmer. So they flower earlier, as it gets warmer. And that is the pattern that we see now. These flowers flower earlier. But what about the bees? So looking at this record for the bees, uh, the same time period, uh, it was found that the peak flying date for female bees tended to be uh, after the orchid's peak flowering date in 60% of the years from 1659 to 1710. So in the past, a lot of the flowers were flowering, reaching peak flowering before the females came out, which is good. That means they're flowering uh, before the males have females to mate with and they're going to get pollinated. However, from 1961 to almost more uh, current, so 2014, there has been an increase in about one degree Celsius on average in, for spring. And peak female flying date occurred only in 20 years after orchid peak. So in only 20 years, 20% 20 of the years during this more recent time period has that peak fi female flying occurred after orchid's peak. And if that's happening very rarely, that means in most of those years when the flowers emerge, there's going to be no one to pollinate them because the males are busy of actually mating with females. So the interesting thing about this case is that all three, the flowers, the males, and the female bees, they are all responding to warming, but the female bees are responding the most. The male bees actually haven't changed their emergence date as much as the females. So now there's more overlap between the male and females bee, female bees. Um, but this reduces the percentage of years when orchids can actually reproduce and set seeds. And that's one reason why uh, this orchid is in a lot of trouble in terms of its future ability to maintain its population. 
So I want to end today by just talking about one more example of a way in which climate change can impact the phenological events of organisms. So this example uh, we're going to look at is from the snowshoe hare. The snowshoe hare, as you'll remember, we talked about earlier in the class is a classic example of a species that undergoes population cycles likely due to predation by the lynx. Now, in the environments where snowshoe hares live, which are largely the boreal forest, uh, these are, of course, environments that are dominated by snow cover in the winter. However, with the warming temperatures, snow melt is tending to occur earlier uh, in the year. Now, why would this be a problem potentially for snowshoe hares? Well, snowshoe hares, like many organisms that live in temperate or boreal uh, systems, uh, will have a winter coat and they have a summer coat. And in between, they molt, uh, get rid of their old coat and put on their new coat. And for many species, including the snowshoe hare, these coats are different colors. In the winter, they're white, they blend in with the snow, um, but then in the spring, they molt into a brown coat that allows them to blend in with the darker surface of, of the uncovered uh, ground. Now, what happens when the snow melts earlier uh, to these uh, snowshoe hares, but their coat molting pattern doesn't really change. The timing of their molt doesn't change. Well, that was the question that was explored by some researchers. And in this study, the researchers put radio collars on some snowshoe hares and then tracked them to see what their fate was. Uh, and then they looked at their fate relative to their color contrast with the environment. So for example, this hair and the bottom left here, uh, this bunny has a contrast of zero uh, with its background, whereas the hair on the right has a contrast of 100%. And so they used that measure of color contrast, which is shown here on the x-axis, and looked at how that impacted the weekly survival of these radio collared rabbits. And what, as you can see, what they found was that as the degree of color contrast increased, uh, their weekly survival rate declined. Um, so, of course, that's not surprising if, as other research has shown, about 90% of snowshoe hares may be killed by predators. And when they're more contrasted with their background, they're easier to see, so they're probably easier to prey upon. Um, and are more likely to be killed. Uh, so things like changes in survival rate, rate are likely to have a big impact on their population size. Um, however, one maybe sort of happier note to end this uh, lecture on is that there appears to be a lot of variation for the timing of molting into the brown coat um, with some of the more southern populations uh, tending to have individuals that molt much earlier. And there are some populations that actually always have a brown coat. And so this is a good sign because that means that the species has the genetic variation necessary to respond, at least evolutionarily, through the process of natural selection um, to an earlier snow melt. And so hopefully the sort of decline in survival rate might be temporary as well, and these populations hopefully will be able to uh, evolve uh, and time their molting uh, to the changing climate. All right, so that is the end of our lecture and our class, and good luck on the final, and let me know if you have any questions.